Chapter 18 Elijah, Jehu, and the War Against Jezebel There is a war, a very ancient war, between the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of Jezebel. In this age-old battle, Elijah represents the interest of heaven, the call to repentance and the return to God. Jezebel, on the other hand, represents that unique principality whose purpose is to hinder and defeat the work of repentance. To the victor goes the nation. To understand the conflict between the Elijah spirit and the spirit of Jezebel, we must understand, we must understand, we must understand these two adversaries as they are seen in the scriptures. Each is the spiritual counterpart of the other. Is Elijah bold? Jezebel is brazen. Is Elijah ruthless toward evil? Jezebel is vicious toward righteousness. Does Elijah speak of the ways and words of God? Jezebel is full of systems of witchcraft and words of deceit. The war between Elijah and Jezebel continues today. The chief warriors on either side are the prophets of both foes. To the victor goes the soul of our nation. In the tradition of Samuel, Elijah was the head of the school of prophets. Under him were the sons of the prophets, literally hundreds of seers in prophetic minstrels who proclaimed the word of the Lord. In this war, however, Jezebel had viciously and systematically murdered all of God's servants until only Elijah remained. 1 Kings 18.22 Elijah, as the last of the prophets, then challenged the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah to demonstration of power, to a demonstration of power. Their gods against the power of the Lord, see. These 850 men were the false prophets, the satanic priests who ate at Jezebel's table, 1 Kings 18, 19. They were the most powerful, the most powerful demonized individuals that the host of darkness could produce. King Ahab, Jezebel's husband, sent a message out to all the sons of Israel, and the nation came to witness the conflict between the God of Elijah and the demigods of Jezebel. The term of the challenge were simple. Each was to place an ox upon the altar. Elijah then said, you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. Six hours later, the cult priests still could produce no fire. Twelve hours passed and Elijah began to mock them. Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside. Perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. Just before evening, Elijah prayed over his sacrifice, and the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord he is God, the Lord, he is God. 1 Kings 18, 16 through 40. Immediately after this powerful witness of the Lord, Elijah had the Hebrews hold the prophets of Baal and all of them were put to death. We would suppose that at this point, Elijah would have gone into Jezreel and asked God to finish off Jezebel, but he did not. In fact, and this may surprise you, Elijah came under spiritual warfare. Jezebel, in a fit of rage, released a flood of witchcraft and demonic power against Elijah that put fear into his heart. Elijah ran. You may ask, how could such a mighty prophet turn and run? The answer is not simple. In fact, the situation worsens. Listen, we then see Elijah sitting under a juniper tree, bewailing that he is no better than his father's, actually praying that he might die. 1 Kings 19.4 What pressure overwhelmed this great man of God that he would fall prey to fear and discouragement? 
the spirit of Jezebel. See? And now let the reader understand. Listen. Let the listener understand. When you war against the principality of Jezebel, even though you stand against her lust and witchcrafts, you must guard against the power demons of fear and discouragement, for these she will send against you to distract you from your warfare and your victory. Let me say it again. When you war against the principality of Jezebel, even though you stand against her lust and witchcraft. You must guard against the power demons of fear and discouragement. For these she will send against you to distract you from your warfare and your victory. The drama continues. It is an established principle in the spirit realm that one can impart a measure of the spirit side of himself to another without the fullness of his own spirit diminishing. We see this when Moses' spirit was placed upon 70 elders, Numbers 11, 24, and 25. We can behold this in the process of the father's sins being passed on to the children. And of course we see this in Christ's spirit dwelling within us. With this concept in mind, we can understand how the spirit of Elijah was sent to minister through the soul of John the Baptist. Once before Elijah's spirit had been placed upon another individual, you will remember that Elisha, the prophet who succeeded Elijah, received a double portion of Elijah's spirit, 2 Kings 2, 9 and 10. Now again, the spirit of Elijah was ministering, activating, inspiring, and creating in John the Baptist the same kind of intensity which dwelled in Elijah himself. John was to go as forerunner before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke 1, 15 through 17. Jesus said of the Baptist, he himself is Elijah who was to come. Matthew 11, 14, 17, 11 through 13. John even looked like Elijah. He had returned. The spirit of Elijah was commissioned and sent into the world. Like Elijah, John proclaimed the need for repentance wherever he saw sin. One such area was in the adulterous lives of King Herod and his wife Herodias. When John confronted them, Herodias had him imprisoned, Mark 6, 19. But who was this manipulating and controlling in the dark? Listen. Who was this manipulating and controlling in the dark spiritual side of Herodias? As Elijah's spirit ministered through John, so Jezebel had surfaced into this world through Herodias. What Jezebel did to Elijah in the wilderness, Herodias now did to John. Jezebel heralded fear and discouragement, which leads to self-doubt and confusion against the servant of God. John the Baptist, who had visibly seen the Spirit descend as a dove upon Christ, who heard God's audible voice bearing witness that Jesus was the Son of God, was now asking if Jesus truly was the Messiah, or should they look for another, Matthew 11:3. And a strategic day came when Herod gave a banquet, Mark 6, 21. Strategic is the perfect word to describe the timing of this event. For in this war between the spirits of Elijah and Jezebel, Herodias had her daughter dance before Herod, enticing out of him a promise to give whatever she asked. At her mother's request, more truly at Jezebel's request, she, be, she demanded the head of John the Baptist. And temporarily, the confrontation between the spirits of these two eternal enemies subsided. Elijah is coming. 
2,000 years ago, Jesus stated that the ministry of Elijah was not over. He promised Elijah is coming and will restore all things, Matthew 17, 11. Malachi the prophet also wrote, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will restore. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Elijah is coming to war and restore. He came before the great day and he is returning before the terrible day of the Lord. Remember, however, the principle of spirit mentioned earlier that one can impart a measure of the spirit side of himself to another without the fullness of his own spirit diminishing. For today, even as God did with Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist, the Lord is raising up an Elijah company of prophets, spirit-filled men and women sent forth to prepare the way for the return of Christ. Let it also be known that if Elijah is coming before Jesus returns, so also is Jezebel. Indeed, do you not see her in our land in the abundance of witchcraft and harlotries? Do you not hear her brazen voice rejecting God's authority and exalting her rebellion in feminism? Have you not beheld her causing even God's bondservants to commit acts of immorality? Revelations 2.20 Seeing Jezebel so blatantly manifest herself only confirms that the spirit of Elijah is already here, bringing repentance and raising up warring prophets throughout our land. In fact, if you are going to serve God during the reign of Jezebel, the warfare itself will thrust you into a prophetic anointing simply that you may survive. In the Old Testament, we see how God destroyed Jezebel. Jehu, the newly crowned king of Israel, was sent by the word of the Lord through Elijah's successor, Elisha, to fulfill God's promise. As Jehu and his men furiously drove their chariots toward Jezreel, the kings of Israel and Judah came out to meet him. Is it peace, Jehu, they asked? And he answered, What peace so long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? 2 Kings 9, 21-26 And Jehu slew the two kings. Immediately afterwards, he rode into Jezreel to confront Jezebel. The word tells us that when she saw him, she painted her eyes and adorned her head, and looking out, an upper window, she called to him, It is well, Zimri, Jehu, your master's murderer. Then he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three eunuchs looked down at him, and he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. 2 Kings 9, 30-33 There was something in Jehu's spirit that we must possess today in our war against Jezebel. While we must be compassionate toward those captured by Jezebel, Jehu had no mercy, no hope for reform, no compromise, or no sympathy whatsoever toward the demonic spirit. Jehu trampled her underfoot while she lay bleeding and near death he finished her beneath the feet of his horse. So also with us we must have no tolerance whatsoever for the spirit. There can be no peace, no relaxing under our fig tree until Jezebel is slain. We must stop living for comfort as long as her harlotries and witchcrafts are so many in our land. We must refuse to settle for a false peace based on compromise and fear, especially when the Spirit of God is calling for war. It is significant that the eunuchs cast her down. Some of you are some of you who are reading this have been made eunuchs, slaves to this evil spirit. Some of you hearing this have been made eunuchs, slaves to this evil spirit. 
Today, right now, God is giving you the privilege of participating in the eternal judgment against Jezebel. You cast her down, side with God, and let the judgments of God come forth. Let us pray. It is time for the prophets to unite, Lord. Let us. Father God, let us. It is time for the prophets to unite against this spirit under the anointing of Elijah in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us arise in the indignation of Jehu and cast Jezebel down in Jesus' name. Even now we wash ourselves in the precious blood and having been cleansed from any defilement of sin, we bind and plunder the stronghold of Jezebel. Pray with us. Spirit of Jezebel, in the authority of Jesus Christ, which gives us as his servants, we release your captives. We set free your slaves. We speak to the eunuchs. Cast down your sympathetic strongholds toward Jezebel. Cast down her evil imaginations from your minds. In the power of Jesus' name, we release you from her psychic grip upon your soul. In the authority of the living Christ, we proclaim holy war upon the spirit of Jezebel. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.